Welcome to Health, Wellbeing and Lifestyle, where professionals in the field inform, educate and inspire the community to be healthier, more balanced and live the lifestyle they love. And today we have Carolyn Pope in the studio. She's an animal communicator and therapist. And we are going to be talking about the art of animal communication. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Yeah, it's lovely to have you. Now, can anybody communicate with animals? Absolutely. We are all born with the ability to communicate. Communication is telepathics. Tele is distance. Pathics is feeling. So essentially, it's feeling over a distance. We're all born with the ability. A mother takes her baby into the hospital and says, there's something wrong with my baby. The doctors and nurses always listen because most of the time there is. Identical twins, one just knowing what the other's doing, that's been documented throughout history. It's all telepathics. But of course, from the baby's perspective, unless it's actually dying, telepathics really don't get validated. Then the child says its first word, mom or dad or whatever, everyone makes a fuss. So the child learns verbalizing gets my needs met, telepathics not so much. Then they get that bit older and yeah, you know, they might say the pony's got a stomach ache or the dog's got a headache. And often parents will either punish the child for lying or make fun of them. Don't be silly, horses can't talk. So of course you start shutting down on one and building up on the other. And telepathics is like any muscle. You don't use it, you lose it. And how can we communicate with animals? Clear mind, always a good thing. People that meditate, I don't, um, often find that helpful. Water's really important because you're using your energetic field. It's electromagnetic. Think of the snowy hydro scheme. The more water you drink, the easier it is. As a coffee addict, I really struggled with that in the beginning. But also don't start with your own animals. Start with someone else's because you need to remain detached in order to know what you're getting is from that particular animal and not from yourself. You know, it's like doctors don't treat their own children. Clairvoyants never read for themselves. You need that detachment, particularly when you're starting and you also need honest feedback so you know whether you're on the right track or not. Um, do you have any examples of animal communication that you could share? Absolutely. Very first, when I'd read the book, I actually started by reading a book back in the mid 90s called Surprise, Surprise, Commuting, Communicating with Animals by a guy called Arthur Myers, who was a journalist, went down the horse paddock and the first horse I saw told me it wanted clean water. I looked in the trough, there was nothing there. I spent two and a half years working every day, giving myself the migraine from hell quite often before I got anything else. And every time that horse walked by me, if he was on the lead rope, he'd plant his feet, stop and eyeball me. I'd love to know what the poor guy was trying to get through. Never got through anything again. Uh, one horse I worked with, the owner had um, called me as a last resort. The horse twice a year would blow up massively with fluid. It was down at the Werribee Vet School. It actually had to have a tracheotomy to keep breathing. That's how much fluid we're talking. They were feeding it bananas by the dozen because they were having to give it so much frutix or frusamide diuretics to get rid of the fluid that it was losing all its potassium. They were going to euthanize it. Again, this was before internet. She literally pulled out a whole trolley full of vet notes. Started talking with the mayor and the first thing she showed me was her foal and then said problems been since then. And the owners went, oh my God, she's never come back in season since she had the foal. And then they realized that the twice a year she was having the problem was actually when horses come in season twice a year. And it was when this was happening. A craniosacral therapy session from, this was before I did it, from the lovely Deb Lee and a couple of bottles of she oak, the Australian bush flower essence, and the mare never had a problem again. Craniosacral therapy was derived from osteopathy, I think about 35, 40 years ago, but don't quote me on the dates. Uh, there was a couple of different people that discovered it, but basically your cranio is your cranium, sacral is your sacrum. The craniosacral rhythm can be felt anywhere on the body. You've got your heart rate, you've got your respiratory rate, you've got your cranial rhythm. 
CST as it's called, craniosacral CST for short, much easier for most people, um, works on the limbic system in the brain, so the emotional part of the brain. The most pressure you're putting on a body is literally that of a five cent piece. And then you're, it's basically that whole doing and non-doing. The body's got its own wisdom. It knows what it needs. And quite often what a practitioner thinks the body needs versus what the body actually needs is a little bit like the Montagues and the Capulets. So you're simply allowing the body to unwind. And that's what I love about it. You'll have physical releases. You'll have emotional releases. Animals can process for two to three days afterwards and the results really are profound. And yet it's so gentle, you can do it on a newborn. And could you give us some tips on how we can communicate with animals? Think of, for most people, I think they find the proverbial thought bubble. You know, the little cartoon bubbles, putting a thought in there and throwing it at the animal. And whatever you get back first, that very instantaneous, that's communication. Quite often when I'm talking with an animal, the owner will get as far as, did he, do they? I've already got the answer, yes or no, because a thought is instantaneous. Trying to put words to something, particularly if it's an important concept, can take you a second or two. And of course, the thoughts being so instantaneous, it's trust your gut. That's the biggest thing. And whatever comes into your mind first, don't try and do the logical right brain versus left brain argument, you only wind up with a headache. Trust that gut, whatever you get instantaneously and first is right, every time. Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us. That was fascinating. If you want more information on Carolyn Pope and the art of animal communication, head to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. Stay with us after the break, another interesting guest with an exciting topic. Stay tuned. After the break, holistic coach Steve Hall is talking about our relationship with fear. Welcome back. And today we have Steve Hall back with us, our holistic coach and Part of the series in living a life of value and meaning, today's topic is our relationship with fear. So welcome back, Steve. Thank you, Linda, and thanks for the introduction. Our relationship with fear. I know, right? Uh, a lot of people don't like fear, and I can well understand that. But we've been talking about how to love yourself more, how to connect with your values and, and your purpose in life. And fear is an important part of that because there's people want to do things, they want to improve their life, they want to get better at what they're doing, and then they find something stopping them. And it's quite often the relationship with fear. So I thought it's worthwhile to explore that a little bit and find out what is our relationship with fear and how does that impact us. With that in mind, how do we create a better relationship with fear? I'll share a little bit about what I imagine in my own mind when I'm, when I'm thinking about fear and when I'm realizing the effect it's having on me, right? So uh, I imagine my emotions, I, I like listening to them now, something that I learned along the way in my life. It's like, listen to your emotions, what they're telling you. Don't ignore them or try and push them away. So I imagine in my own mind, when I've got a dilemma or something, or I've got an emotion expressing itself, I imagine there's a boardroom, like a boardroom table in my mind with a, you know, a chairman and all that, and the emotions are sitting at the table. And the emotion that is quite often the loudest is fear. And one thing that I've understood about fear, it's sort of like fear has anxiety itself. And the less my self-belief is turning up, the less self-belief I have in myself, the noisier my fear gets. So it's like my fear is present when I'm not and learning how, who I am, you know, what I value and taking control of my life and responsibility is what affects, has a bit, the most effect on fear. You know, it's sort of like my fear calms down and then it becomes just more like a, a warning, like a, like a pet dog. <laughs> um, I often find, you know, my, my fear is a lot like a pet dog. It'll bark at something if it gets scared, right? And my job, if my self-belief is big enough, if I'm there, if I'm present, my job is 
what's up, boy? Acknowledge that it's spoken and give it a pat and go, it's all right, it's all right, I've got this, I'm here. And it'll go, oh, thanks, you've noticed, you've listened to me, and it'll sit down. And that's, that's what fear's like for me. It's like I've recreated what it means. It no longer controls me. I'm not scared of fear myself because I realise now it's just trying to get my attention so I can be aware of something. And that's the relationship with fear that we all need to understand so we can build our self-belief and then we can achieve what it is we really want to achieve in our life. You know what, the things that we love, our, our mission, our values, our purpose, all of that is possible if fear is coming along for the ride and, and not calling the shots. How would it tie in with that? How would we break for free, really, of that fear that's... See, see fear is ever-present. Uh, and it, it's meant to be, it's quite a useful emotion. It's not something that we need to overcome or overpower um, a lot of our life, that's, that's our first thing that we want to do with fear is we want to stop it. We want to push it down, push it away, get away from it, distract ourselves. And this is what we find when we try and pursue what we love. We'll get distracted and we'll find that we can't achieve it. And we, people will say, why am I procrastinating? Well, fear can often be the, the cause. You know, fear gets too strong and we're not listening to it. We're trying to suppress it. So it's very important we get a, a good relationship, not just with fear, with all our emotions, but fear is a really important one to start with because it's the one that's loudest. Um, it wants reassurance most. So we have to give that reassurance to ourselves. Take a deep breath. We've talked about breathing before. Oh, wonderful. Deep breath, and it'll send a signal to ourselves and our emotions, I'm okay, um, I've got this and then you can have that conversation with your emotions, fear being one of them. So for our viewers, what would be the best advice from today with their fears? It would be the breathing technique to start with and start reflecting on what do I really want here and what's really worrying me. So you take a deep breath in and you listen to what fear is expressing to you. What are you really worried about? If you write it down, um, is a good way. Uh, just get to the point. What is that thing that I'm worried about? Because whatever we're, the fear is telling us, we try and attach to everything and we start worrying about way too much. But when you write it down, you have to become quite specific and you'll find that this might only be one thing and it stops it bouncing around and like a snowball getting bigger and bigger as it rolls downhill and you can't go to sleep at night, you know, it keeps you awake. So writing it down, becoming quite specific with what it is and you go, actually, that's a little bit, you know, a bit, it's good. Now I can focus on that. You know, I'm not getting distracted. I'm not catastrophizing it. It's not getting out of control. Yeah, okay. And then you can sort of speak to your emotion. I've got this. Yeah, no, I can do that. And I want to do this, whatever it is. Like it might be giving a talk in front of people. I want to do this. And then your fear will just, it'll settle down. It'll still be there, but you'll have a good relationship with it. You just go, what am I really worried about? And if I have to write down, I'm nervous about what people will think when I'm talking to them, I'll see how that's nothing to get over dramatic. It's not the end of life, you know, the sky's not gonna fall in. Um, and that puts it in context for me. And I go, I've got this. Yeah, no, it's all right. And I reassure myself. And then I go, this is something I want. And honestly, the, the, the whole feeling changes. And I've really, develop this technique to a point where I don't really worry about that sort of stuff anymore. So that's what it's all about and it's connecting us with our values, what we love in life and accepting all our emotions. It's really good. Thanks so much Steve. And for more of, from Steve and living a life of value and meaning and specifically your relationship with fear, then please go to his webpage on our website healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au and after the break, we'll be back with another guest and another topic. Stay tuned. After the break, optimizing coach Helen Mack is talking about maintaining momentum. Welcome back. And next we have Helen Mack back with us for the third in her series about optimizing outcomes. And today it's about maintaining momentum. 
So over to you really, Helen. How do we ma maintain momentum? Isn't it hard? Sometimes we get things going, we just get started and then something gets in our way and we grind to a halt. Or it just feels so hard that we never even get going in the first place. So maximising momentum is about taking advantage of the little improvements, of the little successes that we have along the way. So the idea here is one of the important elements is celebrating success, even tiny wee ones. Often we wait to celebrate until a big thing has happened, until we've achieved something wonderful and marvellous and it just gets so hard to keep going. Because the, th the, big, the good goals, the big goals that we achieve over, uh, during our lives, whether that be a community goal, a family goal, a health goal, a wealth goal, whatever, they're not going to happen overnight. The big ones take time and effort. If we don't take time out along the way to go, yay, I made a tiny step forward. Yay, I made that adjustment. If we don't celebrate along the way, then it can really much feel like a grind. So maximising momentum is partially about celebrating the baby steps along the way and not waiting until the end for the big party. As you and I know, sometimes goals change. If you wait till the end, you might not get to the end that you thought it was going to be. You might have had a detour and end up in a completely different outcome in terms of what you want to be able to celebrate. So as a very small example, um, I got married in, in isolation. So um, I, we, had, we had all kinds of plans for this fabulous wedding ceremony that we we're going to have and it ended up being me and my beautiful new husband and eight friends in a library at his farm. It was wonderful, but if we had only chosen to celebrate the big event, then we wouldn't have been celebrating the little wins along the way, the little pieces of the puzzle that fell in. The fact that my, my dress arrived 48 hours before the wedding, that was a celebration. So all of those little pieces kept us going at a time when sometimes it felt really, really hard. We need to make sure that we're recognising our efforts and the efforts of others in our team, our crew, our family, our group recognising other people's efforts can also help our momentum build and grow. It can even be, because I was just tuned into that, I, I, I kind of heard a lot of this stuff and then I thought, um, what, I, what really clicked with me was something like, and I'm sure you use this, is like giving yourself a treat when you get mm -hmm. to a certain stage or yes. really celebrating it in a way that is, is important for you. And, is, and is what you've correct? said there is perfect. What's yeah. important to you? So what you might use to celebrate and what someone else might use to celebrate can be two completely different things. And I think we also have an unfortunate habit of deciding that we're going to celebrate with big stuff. So as an example, I'm, I'm a reader, I love reading, and so a treat could be just spending an hour with a book curled up in a corner, or it could be going and buying a book, whether that be online or wandering to a bookshop. One of my um, very good friends and business partners, what he does is when he's achieved a small goal that he wants to celebrate, he takes himself off to the movies. He has three young children. He goes to the movies to watch a, a you you know, boys kind of adventure flick. No children, popcorn, relax, do nothing for a couple of hours, and then comes out refreshed and ready to take the next step. So there's no rules about what the celebration has to be. No, that's wonderful. It just is, is what, uh, what's, what boosts your optimism, isn't Correct. it? Correct. <laughs> what, what makes you feel good, yeah. Great, great. How we can maintain an optimistic attitude, especially, I mean, there's always changes happening in mm. life. We always have the things evolving, as you've been sharing in previous segments. And how can we maintain that? So when, when we're looking at maintaining momentum, the optimistic attitude is clearly part of it. We need to be able to roll with the punches, we need to deal with the ups and downs. I think, I think if life was just flat, and, flat and, and everything was the same all the time, it would be quite boring. But we do have to deal with peaks and troughs, we have to deal with detours and obstacles. And to maintain momentum, we have to do two things simultaneously. We have to keep our eye on the prize. So we have to keep one eye, if you like, on the ultimate goal and keep checking that we're still on path for that or has the detour taken us somewhere we like. And then the second piece is that we need to keep an eye on the road ahead of us. Is there a dirty great big hole? Do we need to detour? Are there things that we need to adjust so that we don't have too many troughs? Because sometimes the troughs that we fall in are of our own making. Sometimes we need to um, make sure that we don't fall into those troughs. But if we do, that's okay. We're allowed to pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off and take the next step. Such a thing is too much of a good thing, too much momentum about 
moving going forward? Yeah, I think sometimes if we change, if we're changing too fast or taking on too many new things, our system goes into shock. And so too much momentum, too much change um, can be exhausting. So it's great to really get yourself going, but make sure that you're monitoring your energy levels. Make sure that you are filling yourself up both with food and water, like the general you know, nutrition type things, but also with hanging out with good people, putting in some positive or uh, affirming information into your head, uh, making sure that you're not spending time with people who are naysayers about your goal. So too much momentum can be exhausting. And if we get too fast, we sometimes just need to go, okay, I just need a timeout. Sometimes too much momentum will take us past the point where we should have made an adjustment. And when we end up at the other end of the, of the road, we'll go, mm, this isn't quite where I wanted to be. And easy to go off course then, I suppose, and go off on the path and realize, and suddenly realize that that's not really, that's not really a good feeling for me. That's right. If we go back to our questions from last time, just checking in with the why. Why was I doing this in the first place is a good way to check. And I, from years ago, I remember going to a, a training around goal setting in the business, in the corporate kind of sense, and they said, it's all very good to be climbing the ladder but every now and then you have to make sure that it's leaning up against the right wall. Thank you, Helen. And we'll finish the show now on that. And for more information on Helen Mack and optimising outcomes and maintaining your momentum, then please go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. And we'll be back with Helen next time talking about how to maintain an optimistic mindset. If you'd like to know more about our show, please like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel.